This is Extra Paycheck Podcast, episode number 99. You're listening to Extra Paycheck Podcast, where you will learn how to build and grow your own successful online business. Now, here's your host, Alex Soul. Welcome to yet another episode of the Extra Paycheck Podcast. This is episode number 99. And in today's episode, we've got a special guest. Her name is Marina Magilko. She's the founder of LinguaTrip, a platform that helps uh, people learn languages and study abroad. A really awesome episode ahead of you, so enjoy today's show. Hello, Marina. Welcome to the Extra Paycheck Podcast. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit more about yourself and what is that you do as a business? So I have co-founded a platform called LinguaTrip.com. And we are basically a study abroad booking platform, but we also help students learn languages while they are at home, so Skype tuition, and then we help them go to a country where the language is spoken and immerse themselves into language. Okay, you just managed to explain that really quickly, but that's actually a lot of things that you guys are doing. It's not just a basic language learning course like Rosetta Stone or something. It's actually a lot more than that. Yeah, it's actually traveling to a country. Yeah, it was like a quick investor pitch, like elevator pitch. But um, yeah, so if we go into detail, uh, yes, yeah, so our core product is that we send students to a country where the language is spoken, we find accommodation. Basically, you go on a platform, you select uh, the language that you want to learn, choose the country, and then you see the list of schools in different cities alongside with accommodations. So you can do like a homestay with locals, or you can do a student residence if you want to be you know, back back to school again. Um, and when you come back, uh, you probably have other goals in your language. So we can prepare you for university because we have a lot of tutors working online. Um, yeah, so that, mm-hmm. that explains more. <laughs> Sounds great. And, you know, since I, I interact with a lot of beginner entrepreneurs, especially in the online uh, business, online uh, marketing world, A lot of people have this big trouble starting a website because they never know the niche they want to go into. They don't know which industry they want to work with. That's that's like a really big problem for a lot of people who just want to start a business. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe elaborate on how exactly you um, you chose your industry? Why did you go into the language learning as a business? Yeah. So for me, that was pretty obvious. So when I was 14, uh, my parents sent me to the UK to learn English. Uh, and I was this straight A student in school, and I thought when I would come to the UK, I would be like perfect native speaker. But straight from the border, when the guy asked me why I came to the UK, I couldn't really get what he was saying. And I realized that the language that I've learned at school is completely different from the language that people actually speak. Um, so, and I went back to Russia, and I was like, oh my god, I need to really study English more. Uh, and then I went to Germany to learn German, so I made a lot of progress and. I realized that the only way to actually start speaking a language is to travel to a country where it's spoken. So in 2011, we started an offline agency helping students go abroad. And in 2013, we realized that the only way to grow global, to go global, is to start an online business. So we basically transferred our offline business into the the online market. Mm-hmm. Sounds sounds really interesting. And uh, that's I guess that's a really big move. And it's a move that, as you mentioned, you had to make. And that's uh, a move that pretty much any business has to make in 2017, especially even very smallest like diners and restaurants, because personally, it annoys me when I can't find a place near me that I want to go eat at, right? Yeah. Uh, let's yeah. say I, I'm, I'm in the mood for, I don't know, tacos or something. And the first thing I do is jump on the online and I try to find a place either that, you know, new to me or a place that I know of, but I just want to know what are their opening hours, uh, just basic things like that. And if that business doesn't have an online presence, well, forget about it. There's no way I'm going to go there. Just, you know, I don't want to waste my time going somewhere and it's shut down or it's closed for the night or whatever. So, uh, yeah, being online is, is essential these days. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So how did you go? Well, first of all, I guess, how did you go into the actual website building? Did you uh, hire out people to do that for you or did you have any help? How did that happen? Uh, So we actually found uh, an engineer who helped us first. Uh, So he was doing that part time in the evenings. And then we managed to 
bring on his friend who later became our CTO. Um, so yeah, that was a lot of trouble, like finding uh, a person who would code and who could be really good at coding because our goal was initially to build, uh, and we managed to do that, like the whole automated process, online booking, and that's really complicated. So we were looking for really talented people. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine because I'm looking at your website and it seems quite complex. It's not your basic blog. Yeah, it's not. It's not. <laughs> And, uh, okay, so once you had that website built and, you know, people knew you offline, but how did you get initially um, that, le not leverage, but I want to say that exposure online, how did you do, I guess, the basics of marketing for your website? Uh, so we were quite lucky to get into a 500 setups program in the United States. So we moved from Russia to the Silicon Valley and... Because this program is really competitive, it's harder to get into 500 startups than to Stanford because I guess the acceptance rate is like 3%. And once you get in, there is a lot of press about it. So all of the major startup um, websites uh, started to write about us like TechCrunch, VentureBeat, Business Insider. Um, they all published articles about LinguaTrip, how we got into 500. So there was a lot of PR. And also, like Russian press started to write about us because we were one of the first Russian startups to get funding in the States. Um, and that was like our initial marketing. Uh, the second channel was my YouTube channel because I started it here in the States. I decided to tell people um, about my experience learning languages and passing language exams and then moving to the States. And then that took off. And YouTube is also a big portion of our traffic right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And this is actually how I found out about you. I found your uh, YouTube videos. And for the exact same reason, I actually, I don't remember what I was looking at, but I found your videos when you explained how, how you were living in London and then how you were in the US. And, you know, mm -hmm. natural curiosity. I'm like, okay, who is this girl? Like, how is she moving around the world? What is she doing <laughs> in her life? And this mm -hmm. is how I eventually came across Lingo Trip. And I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then <laughs> yeah. I got even more curious about the actual business and how you've been able to grow it and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, uh, so as I said, our channel is pretty, uh, my channel is like English and Russian, they're pretty big. You have two different channels, right? Yeah. And how how do you um, decide which channel gets more of your attention and gets more content and gets more of your time? Uh, they're a bit different for me right now because on Russian channel, I really understand the audience. And I know a lot of people want to move out from Russia and they're looking for study pro programs. So I know what to talk about. On my English channel, I have really different geography. So uh, if, for example, on Russian channel, I feel that people are interested in my life in the States. Then on the English channel, I don't really feel that. I feel that they're more interested in the information I provide about exams or learning languages. So my English channel is more educational because as I said, like there are 16% of people who watch me there are from the States and then 10% are from India and then 10% are from Germany. So they're really, really different. And on the Russian channel, they're kind of all from post-Soviet countries. So they're a little different. And when I feel that I want to educate people, then there is a video for the English channel. And when I want to just share things that are happening in my life, that's more Russian. But, you know, it changes all the time. Like YouTube is such a creative space. So I don't know what's going to happen in a month, but I do what I feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds fair enough. <laughs> And it's it's very interesting to see your work because, as I mentioned once again, a lot of people have uh, this problem, the struggle of choosing a niche. And mm -hmm. you basically went with something that you uh, really like and something that you have quite a bit of experience with by now. And mm -hmm. I have a feeling that that passion for languages and and for, for living in different places as well helps you quite a bit to um, motivate you to create all that content for both channels. Because I know a lot of people that are trying to do something big on YouTube and that's, once again, something that they struggle with It is coming up with content ideas for those channels. Yeah, I have actually, I have a contrary problem. So I have a lot of ideas, but I don't want to overload my audience. And I try to do like maximum two videos per week because more is like too much. <laughs> so I have this list of ideas, like hundreds of ideas that I want to film about. Um, and yeah, finding time for that is also a problem. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. I just wanted to uh, suggest you to start a third channel, like a daily vlog. <laughs> I, I am. I, I'm actually, uh, I'm just about to start my third channel in German. So <laughs> In, in German. German. Wow, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So how many languages do you speak? Uh, one, well, so English, Russian, German. That's it. Well, I started to learn Italian, but it's like still... Still getting there. <laughs> I don't Still in the learning phase. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 really cool. And uh, why German? Uh, so uh, when I was, I guess, twelve, we had to choose a second language at school, and my mom was like, "You need to learn German because education in Germany is free." All right, so we had to choose between German and French, and so she told me to choose German. That's why I chose German, and I just continued learning it throughout my life. All right, that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so, Marina, how how many people are working with you on LinguaTrip at this point? Uh, so full time, I guess we're seven, and we have some remote workers that helps us as well. Wow, that's uh, that's really amazing. And how do you find the people to to involved in in your business? Because I find it's pretty hard to actually not just find them, but also trust the people. Because you know, I have a feeling that nobody will ever do as much of a good job as I do for my business because it's my business and not theirs. Yeah, that's true. But it's also it's also a talent to delegate, like letting things go. Uh, yeah, that was a problem for me. But then when you have too many things that you have to handle, then you just prioritize the things that matter to you right now. And other things have to be done by other people. And uh, yeah, finding talented people and inspired people is a big problem. But I think my YouTube really helps with that. Uh, because some some of our best people that work with us, uh, they came through my YouTube. So they just reached out to me and like, Oh, Marina, is there anything we can help with? We're willing to do that for free. And they started like with basic tasks and now they're like heads of sales or whatever. Oh, this is really awesome. And I hope people are paying attention to what you just said. <laughs> yeah. And, and the trick here is to be persuasive. Uh, because if you write just once, like I want to work for your company and you send a basic resume, uh, we get like a dozen of those per day. But if you keep reaching out, like, oh, Marina, I just fixed that on your forum, or I just got back to the client, oh, did you see that you have a bug here? Then you really start to notice that person, and you're like, oh, he's really paying attention. We need to hire him. And this is how it works with uh, our employees. Mm -hmm. Incredibly interesting. I've been telling people to do something similar when they want to connect with uh, influencers in whatever industry, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you can't just cold email a person, especially someone busy, someone who's running a company and expect them to get back to you. And it's not because you're not important enough. They just don't have time to reply to everyone. They will reply yeah, selectively. That, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Like when I w wake up in the morning, 70 emails, I just go through them. And if it's something urgent, now we'll get back. If it's not, I will try to get back later. But sometimes I never do. And it's not because I do not respect the person. It's just because, wow, I have so many things going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so one of the best ways I've noticed of reaching out to them is um, kind of pass passively building a relationship with them. So commenting on their blogs, commenting on their YouTube videos, uh, you know, replying to their tweets, tweeting at them. And eventually yeah. the person ends up, you know, understanding that you are very active in their community and they will naturally give you a little bit more time than they would give anyone else because they see you're helping them grow as well, even though they don't know you personally, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I guess I should tell people to not write you a thousand messages <laughs> through, through YouTube <laughs> well, asking for a job. <laughs> yeah, it's just like so, sometimes they just find some bugs or find something that we can improve and they come up with a list and we're like, wow, thank you so much. And we start working with that person. That's actually very good that they do that. That I think that's very helpful for you and pretty much any developer or people that have websites or some kind of software or something. Yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, what is your what is your plan for for LinguaTrip at this point? How are you How are you growing it? Uh, we're using plenty of channels. I'm growing my YouTube. We're also working with other bloggers, so we make them come to a country and learn a language and film their journeys. Um, so yeah, our plan is to grow, grow, and grow, and yeah, expand internationally. Mm -hmm. And could you elaborate on what you just explained a little bit more? I'm curious how that works and what kind of results you're seeing from, from that. Like how, how are you finding these bloggers? Who are they? Why you're bringing them in? And what's 
they what what does it result in? So mostly the bloggers that we work with are the people that we know. Uh, for example, through YouTube, I'm able to connect with a lot of other bloggers because reaching out through an agency doesn't make a lot of sense because that would be too pricey. So I would just write to a blogger that I know, like, hey, do you want to come to the States and stay at my, in my place and learn English and make the videos about it? And they're like, wow, that's amazing. And we bring them over. Or we just brought a Spanish blogger to Russia and he stayed with an, one of our employees and he filmed his experience, like, uh, I don't know, getting to know, <laughs> meeting Russian girls in the street, taking their WhatsApp, trying Russian vodka. So that was super <laughs> funny. Um, so yeah, and then, uh, they just published a video about their experience and they tell that they've done that through LinguaTrip. And I think this is also how we expand the market itself because not many people realize that, uh, every week, every Monday, they can start a language course in a school, for example, in the States or in the UK or in Germany. Um, and we're actually educating people about these opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And Marina, do you guys have an affiliate program? Yes, we do. <laughs> you do. That's it's, good. It's in the footer down down the website, become an affiliate, and then you get your commission. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, I didn't see it because I looked. I was searching for it on another page, um, but I'm I'm curious basically because I mostly do affiliate marketing. That's most of my income. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was wondering how is affiliate? How is your affiliate program working out for you? Uh, it's pretty good. And again, it's uh, mostly, I think mostly our clients sharing, but also bloggers are using our affiliate program. So once you sign up, um, you just have your affiliate link that you share. And we remember cookies for 30 days and we pay pretty good commission on every service that a client purchases. So yeah, that works. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. And have you seen uh, like, have you seen the same affiliates coming back again and again with the sales or is it more of a like one time thing that affiliate gets your sale and then they disappear? Uh, no, I think it's, um, something like if, if it's a blogger, then he would put a link under every video that is related, like related to his language learning process. Um, if it's a client, I think that, well, maybe a year after his trip, he would still share, um, his experience. So he would share the link. Mm hmm very very interesting and you've been talking quite a bit here about youtube and growing your youtube channel which helps you promote the uh the business the lingua trip and do you think that at this point your youtube channels are kind of the the, the biggest uh, drivers of traffic and clients for your business or not uh, not mine, not just mine, I would say, like other YouTube channels as well. Uh, but YouTube is working pretty well for us. And the second channel would be organic traffic because we do a lot of like, I mean, it's not just YouTube, it's content because we're producing a lot of useful content for our clients because they're looking for tips to pass their uh, TOEFL exam or tips to pass GMAT exam or how to get into a top American university. And we have all of the blogs and forums and videos about that. So it's the way of producing useful content, I would say. Mm -hmm. Useful content. That's, yeah. that's a really, really, really good suggestion. And that's what it is, actually, for most of the businesses. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And what has been the hardest part starting or growing that business for you personally? Uh, getting funding. <laughs> like when we started, we didn't have money and... Uh, our co-founder had to go and start another job because he needed money to reinvest um, in the development of the platform. And so the first two years before we were able to launch were really, really difficult because we didn't have money and we had to work for other companies. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that. So it took you two years to launch the website? Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's also great information and that also should be heard by people who are expecting to make uh, millions of dollars in, in a week <laughs> or two weeks. No, that's impossible. <laughs> like before that we had, uh, I don't know, I had like five years of experience in the market so I knew all of the processes and then two years to build the platform and every day uh, we have our developers working on new improvements so it's, it's an endless process. Mm -hmm. And do you think you could have gone with something simpler like WordPress uh, with maybe some, you know, some good plugin, some paid membership website instead of, instead of uh, you know, doing what you guys did, which is a lot more elaborate? 
No, 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 no. Because we're automating. Uh, like the industry works in a way that you have to come to an agent and he would email all of the schools and make you sign all the forms. And that was uh, a really pain in the ass for me when I was booking those, those trips. And the idea was to automate the whole industry. So you wouldn't do it with a WordPress website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that explains why you needed quite a bit of funding <laughs> to, to start. That. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And well, I, I guess you'll be sticking with that platform for at least a while. Yeah, yeah, that's something I love to do. And it's something that inspires me every day. And I love to see students coming back and saying, well, hey, Marina, I just passed this exam, uh, thanks to the courses that I've taken, and I'm going to this country to study, I just got a scholarship, or uh, I just interviewed with Yale. This is something that really inspires me every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. And I looked at, at your list of achievements. And <laughs> it's I'm, I'm impressed, <laughs> you know, to be honest. And I'm, I'm curious, like, how, how big of a role of your business is helping people actually get into universities? And uh, so everything's school related. Um, I would say like we have these consultations where you can just jump on a 40, 45 or 50 minute call with me and uh, I will explain what's the best way for this particular student to plan his admissions process, application process. Um, sometimes it involves traveling because, for example, if you have just a year to prepare everything and your uh, English is like pre-intermediate, then the only way you can learn it is just go and immerse yourself into language. And I have a couple of students here in San Francisco who came here with zero English. And then right now a year has passed and their English is advanced and they just got admitted to colleges of their dreams, which is pretty exciting. Um, so sometimes they would just realize their English is good enough and they would just, you know, take some preparation classes and get into the university. So it really, really depends on students. But we have plenty of those who take our help as well. Mm -hmm. yeah that's <laughs> that's that's amazing <laughs> thank you thanks and uh marina can you share maybe something more of a on a personal note for for the biz business itself are you guys like fully uh fully profitable right now or are you still paying off some debts and trying to uh you know no we are we are you cash are. flow positive yeah so s since you actually launched it took you two years to finally launch the website, and since it, since it did launch, how long did it take you to uh, to become profitable, or did were you profitable from the very beginning? Uh, no, a little more than a year, I would say. A little more than a year. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's hard. So, how did you guys survive? Did you all had have jobs while uh, working on the website? No, that's why we had investment in 2015. So before that, it was a lot of um, you know our money, our own money. And after that, it was investment that we received here in the States. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's also something that's very interesting. And I guess this applies more to businesses like, um, well, what I like to call startups, actually big tech ideas. And what you have is, as I said, quite elaborate website. It's not just a website, it's a lot of services that you offer. And I could only imagine that it requires um, a lot of funding. So do you have any like tips for people who might be in the same, same situation as you that they're looking for funding to start the business? Maybe you could share an experience or, you know, throw some ideas. <laughs> Um, so right now the scene has changed a lot in terms of investment. And if you're looking to raise for, with just an idea that wouldn't work. Um, so people even like seed funding, uh, people who raise it, they have either experience in building a startup and have a successful exit, or they have been in the industry for quite a while. So they know, uh, the processes, they built some prototype and they generated first revenues. So, and nobody really invests in ideas right now. Uh, so yeah, I would say just build a basic MVP, which is, um, uh, like the basic website where you can test your ideas, uh, and then, um, test, uh, your idea, have first people actually pay you money for what you do, um, and try to grow your traction like in three months and to have a good growth and good growth is around, I would say like Y Combinator, which is a top incubator here in the Valley. They say you need to grow five to seven percent a week uh, and that's good growth so something like that and when you have three months of uh, sustainable growth then you can apply but again with real users real revenue real product 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I, I've actually haven't heard those numbers before. Not that I'm really interested either, but that's that's quite a big growth. Five to seven percent a week. That's a lot. Yeah. 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 So you need to have a really good product and a really good marketing team behind you, or really good marketing ideas. And a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. All right. That's. Uh, that, that sounds great. And, uh, besides, besides this business, uh, besides the lingo trip, are you planning on doing anything else? Are you involved in any other projects or this is like your main baby where most of your time goes? Uh, yeah, this is most of my time right now. Um, I'm helping in some other projects within our team. So we're building also something new, but it's still a secret, but it, it's going to come out soon. <laughs> Mm-hmm. that's that's really awesome and how do you manage the time to do all of that <laughs> between the actual website the supports uh the trainings the youtube the new project the secret project <laughs> <laughs> so it's just because they're all solving my own problems and i really use our services every day as well like i'm trying to brush up my german so i'm connecting with the teachers and, uh, you know, I love to connect with people. That's why I'm filming YouTube videos. And this new project is also involved with what I do every day. Uh, so I guess because I'm trying to improve my life and helping others improve their lives as well. Um, this is what gives me motivation and strength to do that every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that, that sounds good. And once again, see, I think he comes back to the point that you really enjoy uh, your your work. You really love what you're doing. And I think that mm-hmm. helps you a lot to be more productive and to actually get things done. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You you have to love what you do. Do you think it's possible to start a business and make it a successful business if your main and only goal is to make money? Uh, I don't know. Some people think it's possible uh, and they do businesses just to sell them later. And it, it's just different kind of people. And um, yeah, I guess. Why not? If you see if you see how you can make money, uh, and if you're capable of doing that, then just do that. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let me rephrase a little bit. I guess my question was, um, can you can you make can you build a successful business doing something that you have completely no passion about? You don't care about that product, right? That was kind of my oh, question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think so. You yeah, think it's still you, possible if you have if you have somebody producing low cost, I don't know, phones, and you have somebody you know, who would buy them at a higher price and, you know, how to make that money, how to make the process work. So why not? Maybe you don't have any passion for phones, but you want to make more money. So why not? Mm -hmm. If you see an idea floating around, I see a lot of people bringing um, something that works in the States to Russia, for example, and they make a lot of money on that. So why not do that if you if you see an opportunity? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And the other way around, I guess. (laughs) I'm sure people bring stuff from Russia into the U.S., that we don't have yeah not not a lot but (laughs) yeah uh they do not a lot you just have to find that product that you know uh, because every time i travel somewhere uh, regardless if it's europe or asia or or uh, north america i always try to keep my eyes open for these like you know unique interesting products that might be like an everyday thing here in Canada and then you don't even have that in in Europe because it just nobody ever thought of that because that does happen. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's that's what I'm talking about. Like if you see an idea working somewhere else and you have ability to bring it to your country or to some different place then yeah, do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, see uh, I asked you that question as well because at some point I started the website where I was uh, selling language learning courses. That was a long time ago, like eight years ago or something. And mm-hmm. one of the biggest reasons I think that website failed is because I really didn't care about the actual subject of language learning. Mm-hmm. So, so see, I, I see it more in a, that more in that way. If you're if you're starting a business, always always suggest people to do something that they actually enjoy doing, or something they have experience in, or something they're remotely interested in. Because I've, you know, I've failed many businesses starting with that main goal to make money. And then when I realized that it's so uninteresting to me that I would just not have any motivation to work on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, it depends. It really depends on what kind of person you are. Because there are some people who are just, you know, there's entrepreneurs making, making a lot of money and they're 
whole life goal is to make a lot of money mm-hmm. um, and they survive with that. But there are some people like me who need to be passionate about what they do. And I, I cannot imagine myself selling like cheap phones <laughs> to somebody else just to make money. Or cheap microwaves or, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I, have, I have one of the one of the last questions here. And I hope you'll elaborate on this one. What would be your biggest suggestion to beginner entrepreneurs, someone who wants to start a business? What is that biggest thing that they must pay most attention to? The biggest thing is, would you be able to do that thing for free for the next couple of years? Because when we started a company, even the offline one, uh, we were not earning any money. We were just reinvesting everything back into business to grow it. Um, so really ask yourself, uh, is it something I want to do for free for the next two years or not? Um, and really be ready psychologically to fight other people who would tell you like, go and get a job or what, what are you doing with your life? Like you're wasting your time. And I was like, if you are in your nineties or twenties, that's oh nineties. Okay. If you're in the twenties, that's the best age to start a business. Because when we grow older, there will be more responsibilities and you won't be like, if you have a family, it would be really irresponsible of you to reinvest all the money into business and leave your family without a house or food or whatever. So uh, if you're 20 and you're thinking of studying a business, but you're thinking of getting experience first, I think that might be a mistake. Uh, it's better to start some business first, make your own mistakes and before 25, find out that idea. Uh, and then if you don't like running a company, then just go and find a better job. But again, it's so different for a lot of people. And I know people who quit their um, jobs in their 40s and started a successful business. So, yeah, that would be something <laughs> like the most important thing. Yeah, be ready to um, survive without money for the next two years. Yeah, that's that's a uh, very very good advice in my opinion. That's that's what I would tell people as well. And it doesn't just go for 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 business, you know. I mean, once again, it's a personal opinion, and it wouldn't work for everyone. Uh, the same goes for traveling, let's say. And people mm-hmm. say, you know what? I want to build a career, make a whole bunch of money, and then retire early when I'm fifty, <laughs> and mm-hmm. go exploring the world. And I have nothing against that, and I get it. But I. I would much prefer to travel the world when I'm 20 mm-hmm. and when I'm yeah, 50 as well. True. And, you know, every like 10 years, I mean, the thing is that every 10 years or whatever mark there you want to put on, you're going to you're gonna have a completely different experience and worldview. So you'll never have the same experience as traveling the world uh, at 50 that you would have gotten at 20, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And I believe that you could always come back from your travels and try to get a job because, well, just imagine this this scenario, right? So two people come to apply for the same job. One of them finished the university and did, did their uh, internship for like half a year or for a year. And then you have this other person that finished a year ago, didn't do an internship, but visited 15 countries and live, lived abroad. Like personally, mm-hmm. if I was hiring... I would hire the person who traveled simply because I want to hear their stories and be like, how did you do it? Why did you make this decision, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Like the more experience you have in different spheres, uh, the better it is. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, okay, Marina, so before you go, where could people uh, go to learn more about your about your business? Uh, so the business website itself is linguatrip.com. And you can just Google Marina Mogilko and you will see a bunch of my YouTube videos. Uh, Google will suggest you. And yeah, uh, Lingua Marina is my uh, American channel. The Russian channel is Marina Mogilko. And Instagram, Lingua Marina. So it's pretty much the same name everywhere. Okay, awesome. I'll be putting up links for uh, for these resources in the show notes so people will... Um, we'll find it easier. Those who want to check out the show notes and who don't just, you know, go clicking right away while doing, okay. while listening to the episode. All right, Marina, thank you so much for taking your time, um, answering your questions, sharing your experiences. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Extra Paycheck Podcast. As always, head over to extrapodcast.com slash 99. This is where I will be sharing show notes page for this week's episode. This is where you'll find uh, links, resources, and other things mentioned in today's episode. 
also head over to extrapodcast.com slash iTunes in order to subscribe to the show. If you haven't already, please do leave a rating and a review, which will help the show tremendously. Once again, thank you for listening and I'll talk to you next Monday. Perfect.